Welcome to City Square Podcast, where we talk to everyday people about faith and work. My name is Micah, and let me ask you up front that if you enjoy this conversation, please leave a like on the video. It helps us out. If you're listening on a podcast app and you enjoy it, we'd ask for a five-star review. One star is need not apply, um, but unless we're really, really terrible and it's completely unprofessional. So... My guest this episode is Dr. Nathan Greeley. Dr. Greeley is a husband, a teacher at a Christian classical school, an adjunct instructor in philosophy at Indiana Wesleyan University, and a fellow of apologetics and philosophical theology at Justin Sinner. He holds an MA and PhD degrees in philosophy of religion and theology from Claremont Graduate University, and his research mainly focuses on the history of natural theology and the relationship between philosophy and theology. That is one of the most complete bios of anyone I've had on so far. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining. That, that pretty much covers it. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. It's great. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to get to know our guests a little bit. Um, can you give me some background on or like where you grew up, your formative years, um, and a sure. little bit of your testimony? Yeah, so I grew up in New Hampshire, uh, and I was raised in a Christian family. We went to a Baptist church as I was growing up, and we were pretty committed to it. We were pretty serious about it. And overall, it was a good experience for me. New Hampshire is a wonderful place to visit. It's a very beautiful state. It's also very secular. And so it wasn't necessarily the best environment or the most ideal place to be for me. Uh, I'd had very few Christian friends. I had very few influences coming from Christian people my age. And so I think that in some ways stunted my spiritual growth or made it very hard for me to mature as a Christian. And it, it put me in a position where it was just very difficult to become the person I think that, that I should have been or that God wanted me to be. Eventually, I ended up leaving the church uh, in my late teens, and part of that was just because I wasn't deeply rooted. I didn't have uh, a strong commitment to Christianity. The Baptist church that I grew up in, I had learned a lot of great things there. I learned a lot of valuable things, but I feel like on the whole, I really wasn't shown what makes Christianity great. I wasn't, I didn't understand the way that Christianity is life changing. I didn't understand the, the purpose and the meaning and the value that it provides, the flourishing it provides, the happiness, the joy, all these things I didn't necessarily understand. From my point of view as a 16 or 17 year old, Christianity was mostly about restrictions. It was mostly about ways to limit your freedom. It was about taking yeah. things off the table and being a teenager, not being very smart or wise, <laughs> that, that was really problematic for me. That was something that I found really, uh, really unpalatable. That was something that was just not up my alley. So I was started to rebel and I started to, you know, look for happiness, look for, uh, fulfillment in other places. And ended up leaving the church for several years. And eventually, in my mid-20s, I realized that I was pretty unhappy and I had not found purpose or meaning or fulfillment in any of the different things that I had been, you know, trying out or experimenting with. And so at that point, I started to feel like I really had to do something about this uh, this hole in my life, this this lack of meaning, this this thing that was missing. And so I started to look at Christianity again and thought, well, I'll give this another shot. And what I came to realize at that point is that the Christianity that I had walked away from was perhaps not as, as complete of a picture or it wasn't as full of an understanding as as it could have been and perhaps should have been in the sense that I had never really experienced a lot of the aspects of the faith that I'm aware of now, like the, the intellectual side of things. We're, we're, we're talking about theology, apologetics, church history, things like that. I had never 
been exposed to those things. So I had never been introduced to them. I didn't know they existed. And for a person with my personality, realizing that and coming to see that this was a, a big part of Christianity, this was a very significant part of it, that led to you know a light bulb turning on and and seeing that there's actually a lot here for me that I was not aware of previously. Mm. And beyond that, I also just realized that I myself was a sinner that I had, you know, I had one of the reasons why Christianity had been unappealing for me. It wasn't just because the back, the situation I was in or the environment was anti-intellectual. It was also because my will was not directed at the right things, right? My, I had the wrong interests. I had the wrong appetites. I was, I got excited about things that I shouldn't have been, right? Those were the things Mm -hmm. that I found compelling. And so I had to come to this realization too, that, that I was a sinner and that I had, you know, apostatized because I loved the wrong things fundamentally, right? I was somebody who uh, preferred the, uh, the adulation or the, the recognition of the world. I wanted to seem, you know, cool to other people. I wanted the other people that I knew, uh, you know, in high school or, or after high school to have this high opinion of me. And because I was in this secular environment, it became evident that being a Christian and, and uh, gaining the approval of those people was not going to, to work. Those things were not going to fit together or there wasn't going to be a good pairing there. So I realized that I had to either, you know, seek their, their esteem or I was going to have to leave the church. And the reason why I left was in large part because I wanted the esteem of other people more than, you know, I wanted a, a relationship with God or to know God. And so I know I'm, I'm kind of talking in circles here, but getting back to when I was 25, all these things are, are starting to become evident to me, starting to see the truth of all these things. You know, Christianity is not what I thought it was. It's not this thing for just backwards, you know, ignorant people, which is something that I had been telling myself for several years. And I also started to realize that the primary reason that I had left, it wasn't because there were problems with the church or there were problems with what I was being taught. It had a lot more to do with my own self and, and my own, you know, sinful inclinations and desires. So I'm about 25 at this point. I realized that I need to start going back to church. And so I did that, started to read theology, started to try to figure out what I thought about a whole host of things. And that took a long time, it took several years of working through different questions and reading different authors. I, I really, I thought when I first came back to Christianity, I thought that the Christianity I had grown up with just wasn't going to work for me. I knew that that in some ways there was there was truth there and there was value there, but I also felt like because those things that I just described were missing from it, uh, that the intellectual aspects of the faith, the the you know interest in historical matters, the interest in creeds, the interest in uh, theology, things like that, since those weren't really present or they hadn't been emphasized, I came to feel like a different different type of Christianity was going to be something that I was going to have to find. And so I was just reading a lot of different things. I was um, open to pretty much anything at that point. I was exploring lots of different writers and thinkers. And eventually... I decided that what I was really looking for was something that was that was biblical, that was Catholic, that was confessional, and that was Christocentric. So I'd say those four things were, were key or crucial to me. Like I wanted, eventually it became clear to me that the church had to rest on the foundation of the Bible, right? Or the, the, the tradition that I wanted to be a part of, it had to rest on that foundation. It had to <clears throat> affirm the authority and the truthfulness of the scriptures. So that was one non-negotiable. And then second, I realized that the church had to be Catholic. It had its doctrine and its teaching. It had to be uh, in agreement or in harmony with the consensus of the church throughout the, the ages. Okay. It was very important to me that it have that kind of historical universal 
outlook on things. And then mm -hmm. the confessional aspect is very important to me that the church have well-defined boundaries about what it taught that had clearly defined doctrines that it, you know, it wasn't just making things up as it went along. It didn't have some like, you know, five to 10 point statement of faith that just left a huge number of questions unanswered. It was very important to me that these things be fleshed out and these things have, you know, be settled and, yeah. and expounded properly. And then the Christocentric part, it was very important to me that the church uphold the truth that Christ is an all sufficient savior. Christ provides everything that we need for salvation and that we are justified by faith in him, that his righteousness is imputed to us. And that is the ground on which we are considered righteous in the sight of God. So oh, I needed all of those things. And initially I was attracted to Anglicanism. I thought Anglicanism had a pretty good grasp on some of those things, at least more so than other traditions. And so I spent some time in an Anglican church, studied Anglican theology for a while. And I, I appreciated quite a bit of the things that I saw in Anglicanism. Like I appreciated a lot of the theologians that were writing, particularly in the 16th century, people like Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley and Jewell and uh, hmm. Collett and Knoll. So those people were all, you know, I, I found their theology quite compelling and, and, and uh, I got a lot out of it. But eventually uh, I started to struggle with the lack of, lack of agreement that I saw in Anglicanism. So there's just a real lack of cohesiveness and a real lack of consensus about what Anglicanism is all about and what it stands for. So there's a certain segment within Anglicanism. There's the, the evangelical wing, which is tends to be reformed. And that was the, the group that I was attracted to. You know, th those, those Anglicans primarily took their inspiration from those theologians I was just mentioning. So the theologians from the 16th mm -hmm. century who had been active during the reigns of Edward the sixth and Queen Elizabeth. And, and they were, you know, deeply Protestant in their convictions. Okay. So they were committed to the soul as they were committed to all of the main principles of the reformation. So that was the, the part of Anglicanism that I was attracted to. And that probably has something to do with the Baptist background that I have uh, being Baptist. You know, I was more comfortable with that kind of, uh, Christianity than I would have been with like something that was um, trying to be Roman Catholic. Okay. So I was, it was definitely yeah. more, I, I liked the balance that I found in Anglicanism. So there was this emphasis on these Protestant distinctives, but yet mm -hmm. at the same time you had more of a high church atmosphere, right? You had the liturgical worship, you had the prayer book, you had an emphasis on the sacraments. Like we received the sacraments every week, as opposed to the church where I grew up in, where it was once a month. And so I, I like the fact that in Anglicanism, all these things were, were found in the same place. So that was quite appealing for me. But yeah. that segment of Anglicanism that I was a part of, that certainly did not represent the whole. And so there were a lot of people that were not, uh, they didn't look to the same figures I did, and they didn't see them as like being particularly heroic or inspirational or authoritative. They just saw them as perhaps people that were important at the beginning of Anglicanism or at the beginning of that tradition, but had people who had been superseded in importance by others, perhaps as time had gone yeah. on. And I'm thinking of like uh, Anglo-Catholics, you know, who, who they take most of their inspiration from 19th century figures like Newman and, and Pusey and um, the, the high church Oxford movement people. So, and, and also some earlier people too, but, but my point is simply that there is a lack of agreement within Anglicanism about what Anglicanism is really all about. There are some people that want to take it in a very uh, Calvinistic direction, very reformed direction. There's others who want to take it in a very Roman Catholic direction. And then you even have people that would like to see it be something more like Eastern Orthodoxy, 
And then you have people who would like it to be hmm. more liberal or, or broad church. So you have all of these competing voices that have some idea about what Anglicanism should be, and they define it in different ways. And they, they view the Angula, Anglican formularies, like the, the foundational documents, like the 39 articles in the Book of Homilies, they view those things in different ways. Some of them think, oh, the 39 articles is basically our confession of faith. And then other people think, well, no, that's just like a historical document that has no binding authority on us now. And, <laughs> and so there's all these differences. And, and because of that, one thing I came to realize is that it's not a truly confessional tradition in the sense that they don't have confessions that really provide the boundaries or really establish mm. uh, limits and, and principles with respect to what, what constitutes sound teaching in the way that a truly confessional church would. So when I came to see that, and that became really evident to me after being in Anglicanism for a few years, then I started to become pretty dissatisfied with it. Um, that was the, the primary thing. I liked a lot of the things about it. I liked, like I said, the teachers that I had, or the theologians that I had been reading, I enjoyed them. I liked the emphasis on the sacraments. I liked the, the liturgy. I liked a lot of things, the architecture of the churches and, and what have you. But I did not like the fact that Anglicans couldn't seem to agree on much at all. And <laughs> you would go to an Anglican church and even a, amongst relatively conservative Anglicans, you would oftentimes not really know what somebody in the pew next to you believes about this or that, because it was all up in the air. And, and it was really up to the individual to make their own choices, you know, whether they're going to be Calvinistic, whether they're going to be Arminian, what their view of the real presence is, if they have any such view. Um, so whether or not, you know, what baptism does, different different views about all these things were possible. Uh, what Whether the Bible is inerrant, things like that, these things were hmm. oftentimes disputed. And, and so it was a tradition which everybody kind of could just like pick and choose what, what aspects of that tradition they wanted to follow or incorporate and what aspects of other traditions they thought were worth emulating or worth borrowing from. So like I said, you had some that were very much like, you know, a Presbyterian. And then you had others that were trying to be Roman Catholic. And then you had others that really liked Eastern Orthodoxy. And then you had others that were, were pretty liberal in a lot of ways. So yeah. lots of uh, a real hodgepodge, a real uh, mix of things. And, and then I guess the thing that really became a catalyst for, for my leaving Anglicanism is that the rector of the church that I was going to, I started to realize that his views on some things were not really sound. Okay. So I, I started to have doubts about his orthodoxy and I'm not like a heresy hunter really. It's just not like something that uh, I spent a lot of time doing, but I do want to be sure and I want to be confident that the person I'm sitting under week after week and, and hearing from and being taught by, I want to make sure that they, both their heart and their mind and their, their spirit are all in the right place and that they are, they have a sound understanding of doctrine and their teaching what I believe is true, um, at least when it, when it comes to the big things, the fundamental things, the basics. And, yeah. and I started to have questions about that in this case. So it was at this point that I was like, okay, I need to find another church. Um, and the only other church in the town that I live in that seemed to have what I was seeking or what, what I thought, uh, what, what I really wanted was a Lutheran church. And the reason why I came to that conclusion is that I had some prior knowledge of Lutheranism because I had taken a class on Luther in graduate school and my wife had a Lutheran background. So I knew some things about Lutheranism. I knew that it was similar to Anglicanism in some ways, but my knowledge was, was quite limited at first. But in any case, I took the plunge. I started going and started reading what I could about Lutheran theology and Lutheran doctrine, read the Book of Concord, decided this is something I can totally 
get on board with. So this is something I can get behind. And I love at first sight might be a bit too strong uh, of, of a way of putting it, but I definitely has found Lutheranism extremely compelling from nearly the beginning. And I just really appreciated the Lutheran stance on so many different things, the way that the way that Lutherans understood all of those things that I just mentioned, right? The Bible, um, Catholicity, yeah. the confessions that they had, um, the, the role of Christ and the way that he, that we are saved by him and through him and in him. And so all of those things were really exciting for me. And I've been going to a Lutheran church for the now about eight years and I've been very happy. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, uh, like to say that to me, it seems like Lutheranism and maybe to an extent, some churches or strains of Anglicanism kind of seem to balance the biblical fidelity and history rather well that, yeah, because growing up Baptist, the Bible is the final authority. And that is something that's hammered into you over and over and over. And I really appreciate that about my, my background. Um, mm -hmm. But history, church history is basically non-existent or highly revisionist. Um, at right. least how I grew up. I, I grew up conservative, fundamental Baptist. So that was not, my experience too. Not, yeah. Like even Baptist history was not really made a big deal about. Right. So I didn't. Yeah. Have you ever heard I mean, about we, the trail? Of, ever heard the about trail. the trail of blood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't something that I I was taught growing up, at least not explicitly. But uh, I know that's obviously something a lot of Baptists have yeah. uh, have held and taught. Yeah, it's like when church history was mentioned, that was mm -hmm. the church history that we got. That basically right. the Waldensians the and the Baptist. Yeah, the Donatists yeah. were or proto Baptists of you know so right, and I was like, oh cool. Yeah, basically, wow, half the awesome. heretics in the history, half the heretics yeah. in the history that were really Baptists. Yeah, and they were right, and it was they were doing good stuff. Yeah, it's like that's right. not the flex that they think it is, you know. So yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool, that's great. Um, so your areas of focus are natural theology, philosophy. And yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, um, but Thomas Aquinas is kind of one of those figures that fits in squarely in the center of that. Um, mm -hmm. When did you start becoming interested in Aquinas? That was in graduate school. So when I was in college, and I started college a bit late, when I was in college, I started to acquire an interest in philosophy. I took a philosophy class and really enjoyed it. And this was concurrent or about the same time as I was starting to think about theology again, or I was starting to think about Christianity again. And so both of those interests, I, I felt like they just paired very well with each other. Um, they both seemed to, the more I read in philosophy, it seemed like I was in some ways better suited to understand theology and to you know, have a, a discerning way of reading theology and vice versa. So I felt like both of those interests were complementary. And I was at the same time that I was trying to figure out what kind of a theological tradition or church tradition I wanted to belong to. I was also trying to figure out what my philosophical views were on a bunch of things. And obviously it was important to me that those would dovetail somehow or those, you know, I'd be able to combine those interests in some some coherent and consistent way. But I didn't really have any exposure to Aquinas or even medieval philosophy period until I was in graduate school. So the, yeah. the interest in philosophy started as an undergrad in college. I realized at that point that I wanted to go to graduate school for something to do with theology and philosophy, which is what I ended up doing. And then when I got to graduate school, I had a professor who was a Roman Catholic, and he was, a, an, I would say, an expert on Thomas. He he was also a very well-rounded guy, so he knew a lot about all kinds of things. But Aquinas was one of his major interests, and he had written articles and a book on Aquinas. So he knew Aquinas <laughs> quite well. And 
the first semester of graduate school, I had a class with him that was a survey of medieval theology. And so we just looked at snippets or bits of different medieval writers of their works. And we read St. Anselm, we read Aquinas, we mm. read some Bonaventure, we read Scotus, we read some Occam. And it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily love at first sight because at that time I was, I still was, had a, a modern way of thinking about old things, right? So I was still kind of unfortunately trapped in this mindset that I kind of picked up when I was a teenager and when I had, you know, been outside of the church, that older things are oftentimes unreliable, right? Older things are oftentimes yeah. irrelevant. And so that was still with me at that point. So I was, I found the the stuff we were reading to be interesting, but I also was biased against it. So I thought that this is interesting, but probably, you know, 19th and 20th century theologians are much better to read and have a lot more to offer. And as time went on, that's an attitude that I, you know, and eventually just dropped completely or just disappeared completely from my way of thinking. But <laughs> at that time, it was still still present. So I wasn't totally enamored with Aquinas at first, but I did find him to be with with Anselm. Bonaventure is really good, too. But but Aquinas really stood out as the figure that was the most accessible. He was the clearest writer. He was the most systematic. He just had everything that he wrote was very easy to read, even for me, who had little experience or background with medieval uh, philosophy or medieval theology. I found his stuff quite easy to grasp. And I still think that's a selling point. I mean, there are people who think that, well, that's a, you know, it's when things are difficult to understand or really abstruse and obscure, then that means they're more profound, right? There's so there's more depth there. There's more, uh, something more valuable to be discovered there. But I, I've always felt that a good thinker is able to communicate well. A good thinker is able to yeah. express his thoughts very clearly. And Aquinas does that. So mm. his prose is extremely lucid and it, it's easy for almost anybody to understand if they make an effort. I mean, I'm not saying that it's, it's not like reading a children's book, of course, but it's, <laughs> stu it's still stuff that you can, anybody, I think, if they made an effort, if they maybe read an introduction or two before diving in, they'll be able to pick it up. They'll be able to understand what the mm. major points are and, and the, the kinds of arguments that he's making. So Aquinas was really attractive to me. And, and over time that increased and, and grew. Mm. And I'd say the, the primary reason is that I felt like it, he was providing the philosophy that went hand in glove with the theology that I was becoming attracted to. So he was providing answers to philosophical questions that I just felt were very consistent with and compatible with the, the theological uh, answers and the theological convictions that I was starting to adhere to. And, and I've just continued to, to think that since then. So I think Aquinas is great. I think his theology, it, it's possible to separate his philosophy from his theology. And I think it's important to do that because his theology is not bad by the standards of medieval thought or medieval theology, because he is quite Augustinian. So he does strongly emphasize the importance of grace and the necessity of grace, but he does fall into error and the, the mistakes that the reformers often pointed to when they looked back at the Middle Ages, those mistakes can be found in his work, right? So he doesn't yeah. properly distinguish law and gospel. He doesn't necessarily uh, have a correct understanding of the relationship between faith and works. So these are things in which he does make mistakes, just like Augustine did. You know, and I don't hold that against him because that was what pretty much everybody was doing back then. And, and nobody had a great amount of clarity about these things. So hmm. from my point of view, we, we just try to appreciate what we can that, you know, we look for the good, we look for the truth that's there. Uh, 
the things that are not true, you know, we can criticize them, we can point them out, but um, you can also just move past them or overlook them, right? It's not a big deal yeah. um, to just focus on, on the good and, and leave the bad where it is. So that's typically how I read him. When I come across something that is not congruent or not compatible with the Lutheran confessions or the Lutheran view of thinking about something, then I just let that be and ignore it and move on and find something that I do think is true or something that I do think is useful. And and when it comes to his philosophy, I think there's a whole whole lot that we can appreciate. I don't think there's really anything that he says that's incompatible with Lutheran theology. In fact, there's a, there was a Lutheran theologian, this is kind of a, um, a fact that I don't think a lot of people are aware of, but there was a Lutheran theolo theologian named Johann Dorsche, who was at the University of Strasbourg, and he was writing in the 1600s. And he wrote a very large book, uh, five or 600 pages, in which he discusses uh, Aquinas' theology, and he makes the claim that Aquinas is actually closer to the theology of the Augsburg Confession than he is to the Council of Trent. So <laughs> there's a, there's just, I, well, I'm, I'm raising that point or I'm making that point just because I want people to realize that there is a history of Lutherans noticing an affinity here or, or seeing that there's no real... Um, real problem in, in trying to combine these interests. Because oftentimes Lutherans have kind of a knee-jerk reaction against anything medieval. They think, well, the, the Middle Ages, that was the time when theology had lost its way and, you know, the papacy was ruining everything and nobody understood how to be saved and, you know, hardly anybody was really a Christian. And, and there's a grain of truth to all that. So, you know, you know, it was a sad time in some ways, in some respects. But I do think that there's also a lot there that we can learn and there's, there's a lot of real value there, particularly when we contrast medieval thought with modern thought. I think medieval thought is vastly superior in a lot of respects. So I do think that there's a lot that we can gain from studying Aquinas. I think that he, his thought is quite consistent with Lutheranism on the whole. There are things that we, of course we would have to reject, but um, there's a lot there that we can, we can gain and that we can uh, learn from. And particularly with respect to his philosophy, as I was just saying. So his yeah. philosophy in particular, because it's not really dealing with theological questions, and of course, theological questions were at the, the center of the Reformation debates, right? It wasn't like they were having debates about yeah. uh, philosophical questions. The debates were about theology. And so his philosophy, there was no real, nothing about it that would have made it incompatible with post-Reformation thought or with Lutheran thought. And so I think that we can still uh, benefit from studying it. And those philosophical questions that he answered, I think those answers still are for the most part valid. And I think they still hold water even after 800 years or so. Hmm. What are what are some examples then of, of those questions he's answering or um, like mm -hmm. his, the most important questions or the, or the big ideas that he's kind of dealing with. Okay. So I think his real strength is as a, a metaphysician and what metaphysics is, is that's the study of the structures and the, the general features of reality. So what are, what is reality like and, and what exists? What are things and what are they doing? Mm -hmm. These kinds of questions uh, why is there something rather than nothing, right? These are the kinds of questions yeah. that a metaphysician asks, like really abstract questions that most people don't bother with or when they think about them, they think that's just a waste of time, right? Let's yeah. just focus on practical things. Let's focus on what's in front of us. So these are kind of big picture questions, but I do think they're important because the big que picture questions, when we have answers to those, it helps to orient us and it helps to give us direction when it comes to dealing with everyday things. So if you have an idea of what the world is like in general and what's really important in it and who's governing it and who caused it and what it's all for, if we have answers to those questions, then we'll be able to uh, provide better answers to the, the more practical questions and the everyday questions that we find ourselves faced with. So 
I do think metaphysics is important. Most people have metaphysical views. They're just not necessarily well thought out. So almost everybody has some conception of, you know, what a human being is or what a human being is for, um, where the world came from, where it's going. We all have some kind of sense of, of what the answers to these questions are. Uh, just a lot of people have not given it enough thought to have really good answers. And so yeah. I think Aquinas can help us to answer those questions in a way that's illuminating, in a way that prov can provide some practical direction in our lives, and in a way that is consistent with and supportive of and uh, confirming of what we find in the Bible. So that's that's probably the primary appeal of, of his work as a philosopher, is that I do think mm. it's highly compatible with Scripture. It's highly compatible with what we see in the Bible. I don't think there's anything in his philosophy that actually stands in tension with Scripture. There are some people who disagree with that because they'd say, like, his, his view of God is not what the Bible teaches because he's a classical theist and not, like, an open theist or a process theologian or something. But, you know, I would say that those views are really the problematic ones. Those are the ones that are yeah. you know, not actually consistent with the Bible. So there are debates about things like that. But I do think that, generally speaking, his understanding of reality, the way that he kind of cuts things up or the way that he divides things and distinguishes things, I just think it sheds a whole lot of light on who we are, what we're doing, and most importantly, how we're related to God. So I think he's able to articulate in a very compelling and illuminating way how the world is dependent on God, how we depend on God for absolutely everything. So it's a very <laughs> theocentric philosophy. And I think that that's what a philosophy needs to be, to be a good one. We need to talk about how everything has God as its source. Everything is directed to God as its end or as the, you know, the reason for why it exists. God has to be something that we're all, that everything is ordered towards. And God also has to be seen as the, the formal cause or the, the exemplar cause. He's what makes things what they are. He is, he provides the identity that things have. He provides the, the intrinsic intelligibility that things have. So Thomas provides a very comprehensive picture of how God does all these things. And I think it's a very hmm. reasonable picture and I think it makes a lot of sense. And so for me, you know, I find it very edifying, not just intellectually, but spiritually too, because I feel like understanding these things better makes me uh, a better reader of scripture. It makes me a better teacher. It just makes my life better in a lot of ways because it clarifies my thinking and it helps me to understand things better. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it, that's inspiring me to, <laughs> to start reading him. So um, if someone's just a complete noob, so I had a uh, Jared Mendel on the podcast a few months ago and he mentioned right. casually that he was reading Thomas Aquinas in high school and I was sticking mm -hmm. with, you know, Tolkien and Lewis. I wasn't really in well, Star Wars fiction. I, I was not reading any of those people. So, <laughs> you know, I, I envy both of you. Yeah. So, well, but what you're saying, I'm like, oh, okay, so maybe he's not completely inaccessible to someone like me who's a layman, who's not really, you know, reading deeply because he's addicted to his phone. Um, where do you suggest someone start if they want to get a glimpse of like what you were talking about his philosophy and how it's theocentric where do you suggest they start well the first thing i would suggest reading is a an author named edward phaser edward phaser is a roman catholic philosopher who um works he, he taught at i think it's called pasadena community college but anyways he's a very very brilliant guy and he's a very clear expounder and interpreter of Aquinas. Aquinas is clear to begin with, but Phaser just makes him even more clear. So I would say read Phaser. He has a book called Aquinas, A Beginner's Guide. And that is the place to start. It's a cheap book. It's a short book. It's a very accessible book. And that will, you know, you'll know at the end of that book, is this something that is going to do something for me? Is this something that's going to, you know, excite me? Or is this going to be in some ways illuminating for me, you'll mm -hmm. know that by the end of that book. And so if you've read that book, he has another book called Scholastic Metaphysics, which sounds like it would be maybe daunting or, or difficult to get into. 
He sounds maybe really dry, but I think it's it's actually uh, it bears all the hallmarks of what makes Phaser a really good writer and a really good mm -hmm. teacher. And so I think that's the next place to start because that, that will take the themes or the concepts and the the items and, and things that he's discussing in the first book. And it will just kind of add another layer of understanding for the reader. So that will just kind of elaborate okay. on those things and make them, if anything, even more clear. So I think that those two books are really good to start out with. And then when it comes to Aquinas himself, I think the best place to start is this little book that he wrote near the end of his life that was intended to just be a summary of his thought. And it's called, it's been published in a couple different editions. One title is, the, the real title is The Compendium of Theology. And it's been published under that title by Oxford University Press. There's also an edition of it, it's a different translation published by, um, I think it's St. Augustine's, Pre Augustine's Press, but I'm not sure. Mm. In any case, it's called a shorter, a, a, it's called Aquinas' Shorter Summa. So, and what, mm. what it's referring to is Aquinas wrote a really massive work of theology yeah. called the, the Summa Theologiae, okay, which is, uh, has three parts, but they're all massive. It's like four or five you know, a thousand pages altogether. So it's really big. And that book is, def is probably not where you want to start. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not hard to understand really, but it's long. Yeah. It's long and it's, there's a lot there. So when, when uh, this press or this publisher put out this book called Aquinas' Shorter Summa, that's what they're referring to. They're basically saying that this shorter book is like an abridged version of the much longer work. So okay. that's what I would say is, is the right place to start with Aquinas himself. And I think that people will realize, especially after if they've read Phaser and then they start reading this compendium of theology or this shorter summa, they're going to see that Aquinas is something that they can understand. I think most people will find that at least. And they'll, maybe not everything, but the main outlines or the, the main concepts and ideas, those will be things that they'll be able to pick up probably pretty easily. So I think that uh, that would be the best place to start for anybody. Gotcha. Yeah, Jared, I think, was reading the Summa. So yeah. I was like, give, give me an yeah. easier starting point than that, Jared. <laughs> uh, so right. it's not just – so obviously Roman Catholics are love Aquinas. Lutherans, mm -hmm. to some extent, like you said, there's certain areas of disagreement, but for the most part, they appreciate it. Now, I have heard about Reformed Thomism, and I understand you were kind of in that segment maybe before um, transitioning yeah, before, to Lutheranism. Before I became Lutheran, mm -hmm. I was kind of – I started a Facebook group with that name. Um, this was probably back in 2014 or 2015. So it was actually pretty shortly before I became Lutheran. Mm. Uh, but that was – that was basically designed or intended to just increase interest in Aquinas amongst Protestants. And there has been a burgeoning of interest in the last 20 years, I would say. So the interest in Thomas now is probably at a record high at, at any time since the 17th century. If you go back to the 17th century, what you'll find is that you have a, most Protestant theologians at that time were quite familiar with Aquinas, and most of them did have a pretty high opinion of him, both Reformed mm. and Lutheran. So if you read scholastic works from that period, written by big name theologians like Gerhardt and uh, Kalov and, and Quenstead and Hallatz, just to mention the Lutheran ones, you're going to find a lot of, a lot of dis mentions or a lot of citations from Aquinas, because he was considered a very valuable interlocutor or a very valuable conversation partner at that time. After that period, you have the Enlightenment. And during the Enlightenment, you know, pretty much anything old and musty was seen as something suspect, right? Something that didn't need to be taken yeah. seriously. And that's that's related to that attitude I was talking about earlier, right? So since the Enlightenment, yeah. that's just an attitude that almost everybody has and needs to kind of be disabused of. It's something that if you don't actually make an effort to 
to correct that attitude or, or to, you know, lose it somehow, it's just going to be with you. It's just going to be part of something you absorb from the culture, something you're going to soak up. So it's yeah. got, you know, uh, Lewis called it chronological snobbery, right? This mm -hmm. idea that newer is better. So that's just something that people think yeah. these days. And a lot of it has to do, of course, with the success of the sciences and with the growth of technology. And a lot of, in a lot of ways, things are better now than they have been in the past. But I think also in a lot of ways they're worse. Okay, and the thing with problem with yeah. chronological snobbery is it doesn't take account of all the ways in which things have actually declined. So yeah. we need to to have a clear eyed view of both things. I think the ways in which our society has benefited from the sciences, from technology, um, occasionally from modern ideas, but also all the ways in which things have have gotten worse and, and we've become um, diminished and we've our lives have gotten um, just just more adrift. I don't. We we've lost our focus, right? We lost our center. I think, and that's one of our primary problems as a society and as modern individuals yeah. is that we're not uh, we're not grounded in God, right? He's not the center of our our lives, and because of that, we find we try to find meaning and purpose in all kinds of other things, and we we just start lost and it leads to a lot of unhappiness. And that's why I think, you know, we're having so many problems these days with mental health and people just not knowing what their life is for and feeling hopeless. Yeah. So all that yeah. said, um, I think going back to Aquinas in the 17th century, theologians were still looking backwards. So they, they saw this I, mentality that older is better, which is, was the case throughout the middle ages. It was oftentimes the case in the ancient world. It was the case in the Renaissance. So people were still thinking that way that if it was older and we're still, it, we're still paying attention to it, or it's still around, then it's probably something quite good and something we need to uh, be respecting something that we need to pay, be paying attention to. And so that was still the attitude back then, but with the enlightenment and with this idea that newer is better, theologians pretty much stopped reading, at least Protestant theologians, pretty much stopped reading medieval sources. And a lot of them just stopped reading the church mm -hmm. fathers too. So it's like anything that was, yeah. you know, past a certain date, if it was older than maybe 40 or 50 years, then it was just something that was not paid a lot of attention to. And, and that attitude persisted throughout the 19th century and the 20th century, at least, especially in mainline churches and in uh, mainline seminaries, there was just a focus on whatever is novel, whatever the tr latest trend or fad is. Hmm. And that was really setting the agenda for theology. So you get to the end of the 20th century. And I think a lot of people are starting to question this whole mindset or this mentality that newer is better. And they're starting to look at all the ways in which modern thought has put us into a predicament, all the ways in which it has led us down the wrong path or has, you know, made things worse in different ways. And they're starting to think maybe there are things that we have lost or that have been forgotten that need to be recovered, need to be returned to. And so there's this new emphasis on, on going back to the sources, right? Looking, trying to find yeah. old things that we can recover that are going to be helpful and understanding why our society is the way it is, why our culture is the way it is, why the church is the way it is. And, and hopefully by studying these things, we'll be able to fix some things or be able to put some things on the right track. And I think that was something that we were, that was, it was very important to do and has become important to do. And I think focusing on Aquinas was just one way in which mm. that, that could be done. So there's, I would say the same thing about studying the church fathers or studying other medieval theologians, even studying the reformers because, uh, and, yeah. the, and the people who worked in the years following the reformation, I think there's a lot that we can still glean from them. So it, it's the idea is that the church in so far as it follows modern thought and so far as it takes direction from modern philosophers, modern theologians, um, modern political movements and things like that, it's going to get off track. It's going to lose 
the the direction that it's supposed to have. It's not going to be fo- emphasizing what it should be emphasizing. And studying older figures, the idea is that maybe that can kind of help us to reset things a bit. That can help us to refocus and gain a wider perspective or a broader perspective that helps us to see what the real significance is and the real uh, meaning and purpose and and uh, just in, what the what the influences of things and how how things are taking shape and what's causing what. So yeah, I think yeah, it just it's a lot of it just has to do with gaining a better perspective. I think the twentieth century and the nineteenth century was were kind of myopic in a lot of ways, and that like I said, people mm-hmm. were just focusing a lot on what their contemporaries were doing or just what people have been doing in the recent past. And like in modern theology, it's just basically this ongoing story of just people engaging with their peers, engaging with their contemporaries. And there's not much attention at all being paid to the history of the church or the history of theology. And I think that that was detrimental in a lot of ways. Uh, Theology was kind of unmoored or untethered from any longer tradition, from any sense of uh, having a debt or obligation to, to theologians that that came before us and to uh, the teachings that had shaped the church in the past. And so it kind of became a free for all. And, and there's that lack of, you see that lack of doctrinal clarity and consensus across the board in modern Christianity. Right. And and it appears almost everywhere. Whereas if you go back to, the the time prior to the enlightenment almost every church is a confessional church in some sense so almost every church is trying to adhere to a particular understanding of what christianity is and what it's all about and that emphasis on confessionalism just pretty much totally disappears in the 19th to 20th centuries and um Hmm. you know all that to say i just think that there's a lot of value in studying the history of theology studying the history of the church and I think Aquinas is one of the brightest lights in that history. And I think that he can provide a lot of help to us as we think about um, who we are and what we need to do as Christians today and how we need to think about things, how we need to talk about things, how we need to uh, portray things to the people around us. And and I think that he, he Augustine is also great. Um, there's There's a host of figures that we could name that are extremely valuable. Yeah. What, uh, so with, uh, if the reformed have an emphasis on, you know, um, or if they do dig into Aquinas, what do you think is the value there for them other than, um, because the value for everyone is not just to become Lutheran, let's say, you know, or to become Roman Catholic, which a lot of people like it was Mm -hmm. a Newman who is, you know, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Um, so what do you think that for someone who's going to like be in a reform tradition or a lower church tradition, there's what's the value in Aquinas if they're not going to leave or change? Yeah. So sometimes people are suspicious of Aquinas because they do think that having a strong interest in him will be some kind of gateway to, to being Roman Catholic. Right. So it's, Oh, you're reading that Aquinas guy. They associate him with Roman Catholicism, understandably, because Roman Catholics have always revered him and they've always seen, at least since the 19th century, they've seen him as their preeminent thinker. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of in a lot of people's minds, there's this very close or tight association between Aquinas and Roman Catholicism. But the things that, that I've been mentioning, I don't think that they should necessarily uh, be leading somebody or, or provoking somebody to take that step at all, because they are things that I think virtually any Christian would be able to appreciate and would be able to learn from. Like I said, the, the doctrinal aspects of his thought that are inconsistent with Reformation theology, to me, those those things are, you know, just not that interesting. So those things mm-hmm. don't really have an effect on my my thinking or the way that I approach him at all. I kind of bracket those things. So I'm like, there's the Aquinas that I can gain stuff from. There's the Aquinas I can learn from. And there's also the Aquinas that I feel was mistaken about some important things. And so those things I'm just going to put to the side 
Now, the things that are the good things, I think those are going to be useful for virtually all Christians, whether or not they are Reformed, whether or not they're Lutheran, whether or not they're uh, Roman Catholic, they could even be charismatic, whatever, what have you. Those things are still going to be of benefit and of use. So I don't think there's any need to think that I always feel like when somebody starts really getting into Aquinas, and then later on, I find out that they are flirting with Roman Catholicism, or they're, they're thinking about going over there, I, I feel like uh, Aquinas was, was, I don't think Aquinas was the issue. I think that something else mm. was maybe pushing them in that direction. And that was that something else was what maybe led to the interest in Aquinas initially. But I don't see why Aquinas would necessarily lead you to accept all the claims of the modern papacy. I mean, that, that seems to be a stretch to me, partly because, like I said, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think his thought is probably entirely consistent with Roman Catholicism as it is today. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned Dorsha and how he had made this claim that Aquinas was actually closer to, to Lutheranism than, than Catholicism. And even if you disagree with that, and you know, there's, there's room to do so, I still think that there's no necessity or there's no, there's not going to be any kind of compulsion that you're going to experience after reading Aquinas uh, appreciatively, where you're going to start thinking it's time to start, you know, reading the, the catechism of the Roman Catholic church. So yeah, I just don't see any necessity in that, that jump or in that movement. Some people do take it. Some people do move that way. But I've never understood really why, or and I've never mm-hmm. seen anything in Aquinas that would lead me to think that um, that that makes sense. Because the the arguments, my my impression of arguments for the Roman Catholic uh, Roman Catholicism is that those arguments are never very strong. They've never been strong. Like the arguments for papal supremacy, the arguments for you know their Mariology and things like that. I just don't see any strength to any of those arguments. And so whether or not they're in Aquinas or they're in someone else, it's just not something that's going to do anything for me. It's not going to move me one I, one inch. So that would be my, my, I would just tell people Aquinas is not a gateway drug to Roman Catholicism. He is just a Christian thinker who can be a teacher for, for the church universal if they're willing to, mm-hmm separate the wheat from the chaff. If they're willing to be discerning, he can be of great value and benefit. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, I'm familiar with a few like apologetics ministries on Mm -hmm. online. I think there's a few high profile ones that are, I think mainly reformed or reformed Baptist probably. And from what I've seen, there's kind of a, in some of them, at least they basically say Aquinas has no value. And there's this almost, competition or, um, you know, contrast between Cornelius Van Til. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cornelius Van Til or Van Til, which he's the father of presuppositionalism. Yeah. Is there a short version? So, cause I I've seen people kind of like throw in shade one way or the other on social media, but is there for someone who's kind of a novice in that, is there a short version of that conflict? Um, I wish, but um, I can't say two things about it. So one of my problems with presuppositionalism, just in talking about it, discussing it, is that Van Til is difficult to interpret. He was not a very clear writer, and he often seems to contradict himself. And so coming to asserting anything about what he thought is always there's a bit of risk involved because somebody is likely to say, Oh no, that's not really what he meant. Um, so, so he's, he's a difficult figure to expound yeah. or a difficult figure to explain properly. What I do think though, is that, and this is what I see is what makes Aquinas quite superior and preferable to someone like Van Til is that Aquinas in my view his principles, his arguments, the distinctions that he makes, they are all very congruent with common sense and with our experience of the world. And that's Mm -hmm. what makes his thought, I think, quite plausible and and compelling is that he doesn't say anything that makes you go like, what? Like, really? Like, there's nothing that seems really counterintuitive about what he says. 
most of it you end up reading. It's like, yeah, that's, I guess I've kind of always thought that on some, in some way or on some level, that's usually the, the response that people have when they're reading Aquinas is that he's just clarifying something that they've always felt or they've always believed on some level or in some way. Whereas Van Til, I think a lot of what he says is quite counterintuitive. It's quite peculiar. Hmm. It's quite, uh, it's, it's not consistent with what we experience or how we, um, what we see in the world around us. So I'll give you an example of this. Mm-hmm. One of the things that he emphasizes, and this is kind of a one of the most important points that he makes, one of the pillars of his thought, is that there's an antithesis between believers and non-believers. And what he means by that is that they operate in two different worldviews, and because of that, they don't have any common ground between them. Okay, they don't have any common assumptions. They don't have any common understandings, no common premises, no common beliefs, really, at least in principle. So it's almost like the believer and the unbeliever have two different sets of goggles, like cemented to their face. Okay. And that's that those goggles influence or shape how they see everything from, you know, every aspect of reality is determined by those goggles that they have on. And because of that, like I said, it's it's like they're in two separate universes. There's nothing that they have um, that they share or nothing that you can find in between them that could function as a point of contact or a way in which they are able to understand each other, really. Now, that's what he, ta- he says is the case in principle. And I think that by itself is, is a rather bizarre claim to make just because it seems clear that we don't exist in completely different universes. It seems clear that we do actually share quite a few beliefs uh, with non-believers mm. about lots of things, obviously about the most important things like God and his relationship to the world and how we're saved. We would disagree about those things, but we, we agree about principles of logic. We agree about sometimes about basic moral positions, you know, that certain things are right and wrong. Um, now we can we could say that they don't have necessarily a good reason to think those things, so they don't have good grounds for those things. But you like, for example, virtually everybody agrees that murder is wrong. They might disagree about what counts as murder, but almost everybody agrees that murder is wrong. So it seems like there is some, uh, there are some points of affinity or some agreement uh, that we can find. The same with basic metaphysical views and uh, or principles. And an example of that is the principle of causality, which is the view that everything that begins to exist has some kind of explanation for why it's existing, right? Every, in other words, every effect has to have some kind of cause, right? That's a a view that Mm. most people seem to affirm. They seem to intuitively grasp that that's just how the way the world works, right? That's how things happen. When things happen, there's an explanation for those things. So these are the kinds of things that I think that uh, believers and unbelievers do typically agree on. They also agree about how things in the world are related to each other. Um, the Christian mechanic working on a car and the non-Christian mechanic working on a car can probably agree about a lot of things about what's going to make that car run well and what won't. So I think that just focusing on our everyday experience of the world, we can see that there are actually a fair number of commonalities or or points of agreement between the believer and the unbeliever. Now, Van Til says that those things are, we we do observe these things, but the reason why we see these, why these things happen or why we see these things is because unbelievers are not consistent with their unbelief. Mm. So in other words, they are borrowing aspects or elements from the Christian worldview they are borrowing beliefs and principles that they shouldn't be because if they were totally consistent with their worldview or with the the starting point that they have, then they would have false beliefs about absolutely everything. Okay. They would have no knowledge whatsoever Mm -hmm. about anything, even how to fix the car. Okay. So that's what Van Til is saying about this dichotomy or this, uh, this antithesis between believers and unbelievers. And I just think yeah. that 
I think the problem with that is that I think God has created human beings to know some basic principles, to have the ability to reason, to have the ability to discover the truth about some things. I think that's something that we have simply by virtue of being human. And I think if we didn't have that, then we wouldn't be human beings, right? If we didn't have any ability to acquire knowledge or truth, we wouldn't be human beings, whether we're regenerate or not, we wouldn't be human beings. And so I think that Van Til has, you know, one of the weird implications of his views is that if a unbeliever were completely consistent, they would cease to be a human being, which seems bizarre to me. But I also think that the, the fact that he is willing to concede that they do have a semblance of knowledge because they are borrowing from the Christian worldview. They're not being consistent atheists or consistent unbelievers. Uh, I, I feel like that concession, that mitigates or it takes away from what makes presuppositionalism distinctive. Because it's this whole idea of like competing uh, and clashing worldviews. That's what makes presuppositionalism distinctive. But when you start saying, mm-hmm. well, but they actually do share some things in common with Christians because they do borrow uh, principles or beliefs from Christianity that they shouldn't be, then I feel like you actually are conceding that there actually is some common ground. So all that discussion okay. about things that they, you know, the, the contrast uh, that, that exists between them and the way that they have two totally uh, separate or diverse worldviews, that seems to be qualified in such a way that whatever was distinctive about it is being taken away. And so I'm left wondering at that point, okay, so if the unbeliever is able to have a sem- acquire a semblance of knowledge, they're acquire- able to function in the world, they're able to apparently reason about some things, why is it that we need to use the presuppositional approach in, apologe- in apologetics instead of the traditional approach, which would just say, okay, well, so here you accept, you know, certain beliefs or certain uh, premises. And so because of that, let's start trying to build a case for Christianity. I think that that approach, I think that should be able to work if that concession that the presuppositionalist is making is actually making it possible for hmm for a, a non-believer to have knowledge and, and have some awareness of the truth. So all that to be <laughs> said, I think that what makes presuppositionalism distinctive is what's counterintuitive about it and weird about it. And then when they try to qualify that to bring it more in line with our experience of the world, the fact that we do seem to share quite a few beliefs with unbelievers and unbelievers do seem to have quite a bit of knowledge about this and that, when they qualify it, then it becomes unclear to me why the traditional method of apologetics, where we just start, you know, sharing an argument or sharing uh, some evidence with someone and being like, well, this implies that Christianity is true. It seems to me that that should work then. But they say, no, that can't work because they have a different worldview and they don't share any common principles or any starting point with a Christian. There's no neutrality between the worldviews. So... It seems to me like there's just kind of a seesaw that they're on where when you try to do traditional apologetics, then they emphasize, oh, no, the worldviews are different and there's no common ground. And you just can't you can't give a nonbeliever an argument because he'll never accept it or you can't present them with evidence because that's never going to be something cogent or or, uh, credible according to their worldview. Okay, but then when you start, you know, talking about how it does seem that there is actually quite a bit of common ground. Then they they qualify those claims. And they're like, well, actually, there is. You're right, there is. And so at this point, you know, you're probably frustrated and probably anybody listening is frustrated, but uh, just, but just by the lack of, of clarity here. But I do feel yeah. like that, that clarity is something that is uh, something inherent in presuppositionalism. It's not something that yeah. is being foisted on it. I feel like it's it's there. There's this weird tension between wanting to affirm something that seems really bizarre and really counterintuitive and mm. then realizing that that doesn't really mesh with experience. And so walking it back. But when you walk it back, you get to the point where it's not clear why you were making those claims in the first place or why it was important okay. to insist on that dichotomy. Yeah. 
I'm following you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. And I know you I've, you've been you've done a deep dive or a deeper dive on this with Dr. Cooper. Um, I think it's yeah, called. Yeah, we talked about it a while ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a critique of presuppositionalism. Um, so yeah, we'll and I, I got into some different things there. But, that. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean the the main point is that when you're dealing when you have a apologetic method that is has it's so hard to kind of even figure out how it's supposed to work and what it involves. Hmm. I feel like the the apologetic method is more controversial than Christianity is. So to me, insisting on this apologetic method that leaves people wondering how it works, leaves them scratching their head, leaves them confused about how it's actually supposed to illuminate anything. I feel like that is pretty counterproductive because what we want to be doing is getting people to think that Christianity is true. And instead we're just going to probably end up in debates about what, if this method even makes any sense. So the method Hmm. is harder to parse, harder to understand than Christianity is and more controversial. Um, At least, you know, a lot of people, it it seems to always provoke debates. And so my view of it is, how is this really helping an apologist do their job when the method itself is harder to uh, harder to prove or harder to show that it's reasonable than Christianity is? It seems to me like that's getting Mm. things backwards, right? Your method should be relatively uncontroversial. The method should be something that people are just like, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, I'm going to, for example, the the classical apologist is going to start off trying to make an argument to somebody or trying to show them evidence for believing something that something happened in history. And that's a, there's a method there, but most people are not going to notice it because that's just how they think about things. That's just how we generally reason about things and how we decide whether or not something is believable, whether or not something is worthy of accepting. So the mm-hmm. method that the classical apologist is using, it doesn't raise any eyebrows. It's not something that you get stuck on or stuck in trying to understand and trying to interpret properly. Whereas with presuppositionalism, it seems like the opposite happens. You make claims and people are like, what? Like, that doesn't even make any sense to me. Or what are you talking about? And then you get into these, you're focused on presuppositionalism and not on Christianity, which is really the problem, I hmm. think. So that's that's a, the main reason why I just don't find presuppositionalism to be that helpful. The, the claims are often confusing. Uh, they're They're vague. They seem somewhat contradictory. Um, when you point something out, then oftentimes it's qualified in such a way that you're not sure why the claim was even being made in the first place, because it seems like it's being walked back. seems like somebody is being like, okay, well, I don't really mean that in the way that it sounded. And and Van Til and his, his defenders, you know, they say things like this all the time. Well, he didn't really mean that. Well, he says this, but you need to think about what he says over here too. And it's like, okay, but at the end of the day, if you're actually going to have an apologetic method that fits with our experience, it seems to me that you might as well just use the classical method, which basically presupposes that non-believers are able to acquire truth about some things and understand some things, since that's what everybody thinks anyways, right? That's yeah. what we are. Everybody thinks that as they go through the world and they experience how things work, nobody, come, nobody would come to the conclusion that non-believers don't understand anything or they don't know anything just based on experience. You're only going to start thinking that if you've heard some weird philosophical theory. Okay. That's the only reason why yeah. anybody would start to say things like that because it's just nothing. And there's nothing even in scripture that would suggest that there's nothing in the Bible that suggests that the Gentiles don't, or the pagans don't know anything. There's nothing that suggests that they don't understand anything. There's nothing that suggests that they're in their own universe and they just have no ability to see eye to eye with a Christian on anything. There's no suggestion of that. So to read that into scripture and to suggest that apologists need to insist on things like this, I just find it very unhelpful. Hmm. It seems, I'm trying to articulate the thought I'm having, and it's, I almost wonder if it's closely tied to like the, the Ordo Salutis in reform thought, like how, Mm -hmm. you know, irresistible grace, particularly and um, their maybe more strict view of predestination um, that man is, you can't 
bring any sort of argument. Like I grew up in the easy believism kind of semi-Pelagian where you could be a good salesman or you could either reason someone into, into believing in Christ or, um, or emote, you know, emote someone, get someone to, you know, make an emotional decision, kind of like Charles Finney style. Right. So I wonder, it almost seems like a, like a, re, a, a knee jerk against some of that. And then apologetics is then that. focused on, you know, not necessarily the intellect, but building the case for your fallen and can't understand at all. I don't know. Yeah. They, so they oftentimes talk about classical apologetics or really any other method besides presuppositionalism is they'll describe it as like an Arminian apologetic, right? Or that's an okay. apologetic that you use if you think that people can make a decision for Christ. Now, there's no ne necessary connection between those things, right? We can mm -hmm. present arguments to people and the spirit can use those as means to get somebody to listen to the Christian message. That's That would be my argument is that we're not saying that people bring themselves to faith at all. We're just saying that yeah. apologetics can be a means through which the spirit works in the same way that like having a Christian family or a Christian neighbor or someone at someone else that you, is in your life and somehow uh, makes it so that you're experiencing or being exposed to Christianity. This, you know, this, just as the spirit can work through those people, the spirit can work through arguments too, and mm -hmm. can lead people to, open their, open their hearts, open their minds, but just be willing to pay attention to Christianity. So, and the, and the message and the law and the gospel. So apologetics is not the gospel. Apologetics is not some kind of substitute for preaching. It's not any of those things. It's just something preliminary that enables some people to take Christianity more seriously and actually give it a hearing, mm -hmm. give it a listen, actually read their Bibles or maybe go to a, go to church. That's the point of apologetics. It's something that happens prior to hearing the gospel. It's something that makes people willing to hear it in the first place. So that's what I would say. And, and so for that reason, I don't think there's any necessity in thinking that de, uh, pre, a classical method is only consistent with decision theology or only consistent with Arminianism. And so I think that, but I do think you're right that they are responding to a, a caricature or a, a misunderstanding of the classical method um, that that would maybe tie those things together and would see those things as, as connected in some way. But the apologist is not, yeah, the apologist is not bringing people to faith. The apologist is simply removing barriers or impediments that are preventing people from actually hearing the gospel, hearing it, actually yeah. listening in the right way. So that's, the, that's the reformed, a good, the, yeah, I was gonna say that's a good distinction. To, yeah. Okay. They do yeah. tend though, as you were saying, to present their method as the only genuine reformed method. That's the only really biblical method. It's the only, you know, if you're a reformed, a card carrying reformed believer, uh, you need to be a presuppositionalist. Otherwise, there's something wrong with you, right? You're, there's something inconsistent about your thinking. So mm -hmm. they do oftentimes make the case that their method is the only one that's actually informed by and consistent with reform doctrine. And I think that that's a big part of the reason why it has the popularity that it does in reform circles is the rhetoric that surrounds it. The way that there, there's all this talk of it being the only legit, legitimate method, the only genuine method, the only one that's biblical, right? And of course, if you're yeah. a young reformed person or an impressionable one, and you hear people saying these things about presuppositionalism, you're gonna be like, wow, that must be the, the method for me. You know, I'm a real yeah, reformed I'm guy. I'm a, I'm a biblical guy. I want to be a, you know, somebody who adheres to biblical ways of thinking. And so Therefore, I'm going to be a presuppositionalist. And I think that that's, that accounts for the vast majority of the interest in it and the vast majority of the mm -hmm. attention it's gotten. It's just the way that Reformed people talk about it. It's not because it's useful in apologetics, because I, generally speaking, don't think it is. Like I was just saying, I think it tends to distract from what's really important and kind of leads people into these, these ghettos or into these, these arguments that are kind of you know, unending and, and difficult to, to settle. So I don't think it's really useful at all as an apologetic method, but I do think that 
it has the popularity it does just because of the way it's talked about and the way it's presented. And there's a certain peer pressure that a lot of people experience and, and they, you know, feel like if they want to be a real reformed person, a real Presbyterian, a real Calvinist, then that's what they should think and what mm. they should adhere to. But yeah, the, the method itself, what they say, and, and this is another aspect of it that I struggle with, is that they say that apologetics is basically worldview analysis. So what you're doing is you are analyzing worldviews. You have the the worldview of, of unbelief, you know, that comes in different forms. And you have the Christian worldview. And the job of the apologist is to show that the unbelieving worldviews are not consistent, that they're not coherent, that they're fundamentally uh, contradictory. Okay, so that's kind of the, the point of apologetics. And, and after somebody sees that, hopefully they'll be led to adopt a Christian worldview, which is the only consistent worldview. But I have some problems with that because I feel like that's kind of a rationalistic method. I feel like insisting that coherence is the ground of truth or the grounds of acceptability for, uh, for any worldview or any belief system, I feel like that leads to rationalism because you're, lo- you're trying to make sure that everything fits together and there's no gaps, you know, there's no areas where hmm. things are not understood or where things are paradoxical or mysterious. And I think Christianity is a paradoxical faith. You know, we believe a lot of things that are difficult to see how they all fit together. It's difficult to understand how yeah. one doctrine is is not contradicted by another. You know, we, we uphold both of them, but we don't necessarily understand how they are in agreement, right? We, we accept that that's something that God knows, but we certainly don't. And when you use a method that's totally focused on logical agreement and logical coherence, I just feel like that's not a very good fit for, for Orthodox Christianity, which always reserves a place for mystery and paradox in its teaching. So that's why I think another reason why I think the classical method is better, because we focus there, we're focusing on arguments, we're focusing on facts, historical evidence, we're not focusing on this logical consistency. And, you know, that that might be an aspect of it from time to time, you know, we might talk about how an unbeliever, you know, like, for example, they might be affirming moral absolutes, but they have no thing to base that on, right? They have, there's no basis for that in their worldview. We can point that out and there's nothing wrong with that because that's a pretty glaring inconsistency, I think. Uh, whereas the, the <laughs> mysteries in Christianity, they're not things that are free from any kind of logical tension, but they are things that still make sense given everything else that we believe. Like we affirm paradox, but paradox has like a, there's a reasonable place for paradox in the way that we think about things because we of our understanding of God's transcendence and our understanding of the fact that his mind is so much greater than ours. His wisdom is so incomprehensible that we would, we would expect there to be things that we have difficulty understanding. So there's no real glaring problem when we say we don't understand how, you know, universal grace fits with predestination, things like that. Right. There, there's no issue there. Yeah. We're just admitting that God is too big for us and too great for us to understand how mm-hmm. all of his ways and works, right? Yeah. But for the the atheist who wants to tell us that cert- certain things are absolutely right or absolutely wrong, but has absolutely no basis to make those claims or make those statements like that, that is something that's worth pointing out. But my, my point about presuppositionalism is just in general, the focus is on coherence and consistency. And the whole idea is that Christianity does better than all these other worldviews at those things with respect to consistency and coherence. And I'm not sure that it always does. I mean, it generally does, I think. But certainly, I think it's possible for a non-believer to point to things that we believe and say, this seems to contradict this, or that you seem to be uh, you know, like the Trinity, right? There, there's paradox here. How does this make sense? And they can certainly do that. And I, I uh, for that reason, I just think a method that's focused on logical coherence is not the best way to show that Christianity is true. I think that there's much better things we can focus on, like arguments for God, arguments for the resurrection. Those are much stronger, I think, and more consistent <laughs> with just how we think about things in general.
Gotcha. So there's obviously several, I'm thinking like Apologia, um, James White. I've actually mm-hmm. had a, a presuppositional guy on the channel before, the Apologetic Dog. Um, there's a lot of those kind of ministries out there um, that have a lot of content online. Is there anyone doing apologetics in with natural theology or the classical style that's uh, accessible like that? So there are people that like William Lane Craig, who is a, a classical apologist who uses the classical method, but his theology is not always sound, right? It's not always correct. So unfortunately, that's true of a lot of apologists who are influenced by a lot of modern analytical philosophy. They tend to, um, they tend to adopt views about God's nature or about divine providence or about the incarnation that are not fully orthodox or not, not consistent, at least with, with creedal Christianity. And so for that reason, you, you have to be a little bit discerning and a little bit wary of some of the major ministries out there. Um, I think that Justin Sinner and the, the Widener Institute, I think those are two really good sources for, uh, for learning about apologetics, obviously, I'm, I'm connected to those, and I think there's a really good group of people involved with those groups. Uh, in the Reformed world, there's a group called the Davenant Institute, and hmm. they they do good work too. They're, neither of those neither of those groups are focused on apologetics per se, but apologetics does figure into what they do and what they discuss. So, I think those are worth following. Gotcha. Cool. Um, I'd love to do some lightning round with you. Sure. Or they don't have to be one word responses, but uh, so what's on your current reading list right now? Okay. So I'm reading a book by Frank Thielman on New Testament theology. He's a Presbyterian theologian who teaches at Sanford University. Um, I'm also reading a book, a commentary on Mark by Eckhart Schnabel, who's a New Testament professor at Gordon Conwell. And I'm reading a book on God's knowledge of the world by Carl Vader. And that's about medieval theories of God's knowledge. And Mm. that's pretty interesting too. Do you normally read multiple books at once? I do. So I usually have three to four going at a time. Yeah. I find that I'm not always in the mood for the same thing. So it's like sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll start something else. And then if the, the mood for something different, strikes, then I will switch to something else for a while and then maybe come back to the first thing later. That's, I think that's a good attitude. Um, yeah, it helps because I feel like oftentimes when you're reading, it might get to the point where you just feel like you're having to push yourself, you know, because for whatever reason, yeah. what you're reading is not that exciting or that interesting at the moment. And I think it helps to stay productive, to just take a break from that book, move on to something else and then maybe come back later. So, Yeah. <laughs> Good advice. What uh, what Bible versions do you, you use mainly? Uh, my preference is for the KJV and the NKJV. Okay. So those are the things that I read most often. Um, but I'm not too picky about translations. Like I don't, I don't have a problem with reading the NASB or the ESV or whatever. Um, I have most most of the major English translations and use them all from time to time. But I'd I say the KJV is irreplaceable. Like that's the most beautiful mm-hmm. translation ever, ever made. So that's definitely something I come back to. And then we have uh, the NKJV, of course, is just a, an update of the KJV. And I think that it retains a lot of what's great about the KJV while making it just a bit more uh, yeah. modern and easy to read. Yeah, I, I at some point I'm going to dig into how the ESV became so widely adopted. Not that it's a bad translation per se, but just, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's the predominant pew Bible I know in the LCMS, as well as a good chunk of the Reformed denominations. Yeah, you know, its, influence then, then the be, its influence seems to be greater than it probably deserves. I will say that much. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's fine, but it's not... I certainly think the NKJV is probably better overall, and I think there are a few others that could be uh, contenders 
for that having that same mm -hmm. kind of uh, influence or that same kind of popularity. So yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of it has to do with just the ESV, the Crossway was very good about just lining up a huge number of celebrities and, you know, well-known evangelical pastors to uh, endorse it and support yeah. it and promote it. And I think that that was more than anything else that kind of created this impression. This is kind of connected to what I was saying about presuppositionalism. It created this impression that this is like the translation to have if you're a reformed guy, at least in the 21st century, mm -hmm. right? If you're a conservative evangelical who likes, you know, sound teachers, then you should be reading this translation. And so that impression was created. And I feel like that has just enabled the ESV to, to have a huge share in the market, a much bigger share probably than it, than it would have if that kind of marketing didn't occur. Hmm. Yeah. Marketing. Yeah. All right. If you could have dinner with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Well, there'd be a few people that I'd like to meet in okay. person. So St. Augustine would definitely be one of the people that I would most want to meet. Aquinas, Luther, Melanchthon, Johann Gerhardt, and CFW Walther. Those would be the ones that I'd most like to, nice. to see in person. Yeah, I just love to, I would love to just hear them speak, you know, and I, not even have dinner, but just get to hear a sermon from, from them would be just amazing. Yeah, that would be cool. That's a good list. Uh, favorite church father? That would be St. Augustine, but I also like Irenaeus, Athanasius, Basil of Caesarea. So those would all be uh, not, not really close behind him because I, I feel like Augustine is just in another at another level or on another mm -hmm. level compared to all the other church fathers and and not obviously if, if somebody disagrees and and would want to make a case for some other figure would would say that augustine's really not that great you know they might be able to make some some valid points there but from my point of view augustine is the greatest of the church fathers by far and i just feel like his all his work just makes that abundantly clear because he tackled yeah. so many different things he made so many insightful points he, he taught so many things that have stood the test of time and i just think that there's so much that we can learn from him and he's so uh spiritually just from a spiritual standpoint i feel like almost everything he says will lead us to be more pious it'll lead us to just give god the the adoration and the love that he deserves from us so I think he's a great spiritual writer. I think he's a great philosopher. I think he's a great uh, theologian. I think everything that he did was just just really excellent. It's a good reason to read. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but favorite medieval theologian? Yeah, so that would be Aquinas and then probably <laughs> Anselm. Yep. Yeah. Well, Anselm, and I, I wanted to bring this up earlier, but I didn't, I didn't see the opportunity. Anselm was the one who... Um, not developed, maybe teased out the satisfactory atonement theory, right? Yeah, so he is the one who developed that. He has okay. a book called Per Deus Homo, which is where he presents that. And he basically just tries to make the case that reason shows us that the incarnation had to happen given the predicament that human beings were in. So hmm. the, the incarnation had to happen and a satisfaction... Uh, a, a type of atonement that made satisfaction was necessary given the problem that we faced as human beings. And it's a very inter it's a short book. It's an, it's a good book. It's an interesting book. It's well reasoned, well argued, but he's trying to make the case just based on it. One of the interesting things about the book is he's trying to make this case just on the basis of reason alone. So he's not making hmm. an argument from scripture. He's just saying because of the predicament we were in because of, you know, our fallenness and the fact that we needed uh, salvation or we need a redemption. This is what had to happen. And he says that God had to become incarnate because only a God man could take care of the problem for us. And so um, gotcha. he works out, I think, you know, the, the logic or the, the implications of what he discusses, I think are quite compelling and, and it's quite strong of an argument because I think that a lot of things that he says are correct about the situation that we were in after the fall and the way that, you know, the a God man or, or incarnate God is the only way 
in which satisfaction or atonement could have been offered or could have been mm-hmm. uh, that propitiation could have been made for our sins. So I do think that it's a it's a really interesting case and or argument. And a lot of the things that he says, those are things that people have been saying ever since about why the incarnation makes sense and why God had to be both God and man to provide redemption for us, because the points are just really, really good. And they make a lot, they clarify things. So um, they might not be in scripture, right? Scripture might not necessarily make it spell out why the incarnation had to happen the way it did and why Christ had to be both divine and human. But I think Anselm does a very good job of um, providing a rationale for that that is consistent with scripture. So it's not necessarily derived Mm -hmm. from scripture. It's not necessarily something he's taking from scripture, at least not explicitly, but it is something that is illuminating and something that helps us to make sense of what scripture says. Mm Kind of like the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean, obviously the Trinity is not something that's spelled out in scripture either, but if you look at, you know, what the creeds say about the Trinity, that sheds light on the Bible, right? That you have to read the creeds, you're like, okay, I can see now how the statements in scripture on this topic, how they fit together and how it all makes, you know, sense, at least to the extent yeah. that it can for us. Gotcha. Awesome. Favorite reformer? Favorite reformer would be Luther and Melanchthon, because I think that they're kind of like two sides of the same coin in a way, or, or like, yeah, I feel like both of them were necessary to kind of balance out some of the shortcomings of the other. And I feel like mm. both of them made very important contributions. They have different, very different personalities, of course. And I think that you need to have Luther needed a Melanchthon, just like a Melanchthon needed a Luther. And so I just feel like they are very complimentary and, and both of them, did things that were of inestimable value for the, for the reformation. Some people, <clears throat> some Lutherans anyway, might not have an answer to this next one, but do you have a favorite Puritan? I used to read quite a few Puritans when I was uh, reformed or when I was Anglican. I think there's a few that I would still say that I, are worth reading at this point. And one of those would be Thomas Boston, who was a, I don't know, some people might not count him as a Presbyterian because he lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s in Scotland. So some people would say that's after the, the time of the Puritans, but he was um, a confessional Presbyterian. So somebody who adhered to the, the Westminster standards, but his teaching on justification is quite good. It's even from a Lutheran standpoint, you know, he, he does a very good job of uh, teaching correctly about that doctrine. Awesome. Cool. I always like to hear like new answers to that question, you know, instead of like okay. Bunyan or, you know, so that's interesting. Right. Right. Uh, favorite modern theologian. If by modern, we just mean like a 20th century theologian, I'm going to say Francis Pieper who wrote the, the Christian dogmatics that has been used by the LCMS now for almost a hundred years mm. because he's just a great theologian. He's extremely clear. He's extremely well organized. His arguments are almost always sound, at least in my estimation or in my opinion. So I think he's a great theologian. He doesn't, he's not a modern theologian, though, in the sense that he thinks like a modern theologian, because his the way he thinks about things and his teaching, it's all very much tied to the 1600s. Okay, so he's definitely kind of an anachronism in the sense that hmm. he is teaching in his theology, systematic theology, what people were teaching back at the time of Gerhardt, right? And, and Quenchstead. So he's not a modern theologian in that regard. If we're talking about modern theologians in the sense that they are actually influenced by modern thought and they're taking cues from modern thought. Um, I, they're all very hit and miss, uh, mostly miss. Uh, but I would say that Bonhoeffer has written some good things. There's a lot of things that he has written that are not good. Uh, But his, in particular, I'm thinking about his book, Life Together. That's a very good study of Christian community and like what Mm. what Christian community should be and what it should involve and what life in it should look like. So I think that there are occasional, you know, books and papers and things that modern theologians write that are worth worth reading and worth considering. 
But on the whole, just because they're so influenced by modern thought, modern philosophy, modern theology, and, you know, they tend to have a, an inadequate view of scripture's authority and truthfulness. They tend to have an inadequate view of the atonement. They tend to have, uh, oftentimes are universalists and things like that. You know, there's, there's plenty of things that you can point to that are problematic. So I would say that about anybody who's characteristically modern or thinks in a characteristically modern way, but the best, so the best, 20th century theologian was Pieper, but that's because he wasn't a 20th century theologian, at least not in <laughs> anything but but in terms of chrono, uh, chronolog- uh, chronology. Gotcha. I like it. Uh, what projects are you working on right now? I'm working on a book on reason and or philosophy and theology. And that's going to be about how Lutherans should understand philosophy how they should understand theology and how they should understand the relationship between them. So that'll be Hmm. a relatively, it's not going to be a very long book. It's mostly kind of just a, an introduction or primer to those topics, but it will try to stake a position and we'll try to argue for why Lutherans should have both an appreciative, but also a critical stance towards philosophy. One that is willing to learn from it, willing to value it, but also um, believes that it needs to be put in its place, that it needs to have, you know, boundaries put around it in terms of what it's allowed to influence or what it's allowed to touch upon. So, and then theology, you know, theology can benefit from philosophy. It can have, it, philosophy can provide a lot of services to theology, but theology has to always be considered superior to philosophy, it has to be over uh, philosophy has to reign over philosophy and, and basically set the agenda for philosophy. So I do think mm. those things, they go well together. I think that there's a place for both. I just think it's very important that we understand how they're related and what the proper connection is. Awesome. Cool. So for people who are want to f- keep up with you, follow your work, um, I, I don't know if your Facebook is super open or if you um, have a spot where you could point people to to go online. Yeah, they can just find me on Facebook or uh, if anyone wants to email me about anything, my email address is Greeley, Nathan W at gmail.com. So uh, my message there would be fine too. That's awesome. I, I, I've really enjoyed this. I think, I feel like we could keep talking for hours, <laughs> but well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been it's fun. Been great. I'm sorry Thanks about the, on. sorry about the power uh, problem. I realized that I that was. And you're convenient. good. Yeah. You're good. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining us. If you enjoyed this conversation, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and comment below if you are a presuppositionalist and are now angry. <laughs> <laughs> but until next time, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.